Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do and at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about media and virtual production. Second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. And so uh, we'll be we'll be talking about Canvas today, which we're really excited about. It's a new piece of software that most of us don't know much about. <laughs> so it's event processing and uh, audio processing, and we're very excited to see how it actually works. And so uh, so stay tuned for that in the second hour. Let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Mitch, what do we got? Good morning, Alex. Our first question in from the Seventh Scroll in Brooklyn, New York. Morning, guys. We're on the hunt for a good indoor Wi-Fi 6 access point that can spread at least 1,000 square feet. Which ones do you all recommend? I go ahead, Jason. I'm going to start by saying um, the earlier versions of Ubiquity were were like less than great. But if you actually have the Ubiquity router to handle it, these work pretty well. Uh, as far as a thousand feet, you, you got to understand just the tiniest little bit of um, of chicken wire, for example, and laughing and plaster in walls will absolutely kill Wi-Fi. So y you may end up with um, with a mesh system like Eero or uh, more than one access point. Just be warned. Go ahead, John. Yeah, the U6 Enterprise stuff is really good. Uh, I've been having some success with that, deploying it lately. Um, just like uh, Jason said, any sort of obstruction can get into the way, especially the higher frequencies, the 5 gigahertz band. If you're focusing on speed, that's where you're going to get that from. So really big focus on making sure you have the right access points in the right area. I would run cables to all of them. Don't rely on any sort of wireless backhaul. That's going to be less than ideal. And it's subject to the same you know, issues that you're going to have with just extending the normal Wi-Fi range over there. Go ahead, Mitchell. I have the new, uh, I know everybody uh, has questions about it, Netgear Orbit. Uh, and the 6 version works great. Uh, you have a single uh, uh, unit uh, at, the, at the main access point, and then the satellites, uh, you just put them wherever you need them, and uh, they create that nice mesh network. So I recommend it. Next question. Andy Kokendorfer from Vieira, Florida. Can you recommend Isadora training resources? Thanks. The best resource that we have is L from from Trigatronics uh, showing up on Thursdays. At, right now it's at 11. We're going to move it back to 9 when his time allows. But, I mean, L knows everything about Isadora. <laughs> so, so, the, um, so the best thing to do if you're trying to learn it is to jump into those, those meetings. And so there, those are in after hours. Um, I think they should be listed there. And you can go into after hours. There'll be a breakout. Uh, L is, uh, joins us on Thursdays, um, right now at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, it'll be back to 9 a.m. I don't know of a better resource to, to learn Isadora than, than that hour. Uh, next question. Next question in from Paul Valhus in Austin, Texas. Why would you ever get Zoom phone? I go ahead, Guy. I don't think that a normal person uh, would get it, but a small business or an enterprise, that's where it really comes into play. It's, it's really meant for uh, what they call hardware as a service where you get uh, these special Zoom phones or IP phones. So the, the call quality is really, really great. But what we like is when we send an employee home to work from home, we can send them one of these IP phones and it's just as if they're in the office. And then there's just tons of other things like forwarding. Uh, you can route calls. You can op operate all this stuff from in the cloud. So in the back end, if you're used to seeing your normal uh, Zoom interface, you get this this new one with phone system management where you got your users in rooms, you got auto receptionists, uh, so you could route uh, different uh, calls to different places, call queues, you could even record calls for quality assurance or for training purposes, shared lines, call group pickups, you could uh, change phone numbers around. Uh, there's logs so you can see who called on what day, how long they spent on that call. You could set up your holiday hours, voicemails, all that stuff. And it's all done in the cloud, so it, it's pretty cool. Uh, I didn't get with, I switched from Comcast, which was like 600 bucks a month. And now with this, uh, we're spending less and we have more features as far as what we can do. And we don't even have, there, there's actually something else above this on the pro setup that you can uh, get even, even more features. Uh, if you look at uh, my phone, so this is what it looks like on the phone. One of the things that if, if you're in a meeting, you could actually just say uh, participants, invite, and then from here, you could invite a Zoom room, invite your contacts, invite desk phones. So like we have a, a phone in the server room. I could invite the server room into the into a meeting. So I could be talking to two people and just be like, hey, uh, let's invite legal in. And then we could just dial in their phone number and bring somebody from legal in just like that, just by 
uh, you know, I could then dial their number and they would be in the Zoom meeting as a little, it, their icon would be a speaker, you know, they would just, you would just see audio only, but they would be in the meeting. So it's, it's really handy for those that uh, want to use not only the phone, but the whiteboards, the chat, everything, it's all integrated in one. Now I sound like a salesperson for Zoom, but I love it. I'm, I'm using it. it. It costs big bucks, but it, we're saving money as opposed to what we were using before. And does it do international dial out? Uh, it does, but I think that there's a fee for international dial out. Got it. I think that, that it's unlimited local. I don't think that yep. it's unlimited. But it does do it. It just it's just a matter. Yeah, of, it d- definitely is it a, does. It. Like a per minute, or is it a, is it a, co- a overall cost? I think it's a per minute. Yeah, for international. Got it. Next question. Eric Antonio from Washington D.C. Eric asks, Can a hot analog recording cause damage to the playback device? I used VCR tapes to record DJ booth output, and during a recent digitizing session, hotter than normal recording, I lost the high-frequency output from the VCR player. Coincidence? Good, Carl. So VCRs, some VCRs, the Hi-Fi stereo ones, record three audio tracks. They record a left track, a right track, which is kind of muxed in with the uh, helical scan of the actual video on the tape, and then there's a third audio track, which is a mono track, which runs linear, just like a normal, like a cassette tape in a way. That linear one that's a cassette tape, that doesn't have high frequencies. So it sounds like that maybe your VCR has seen that your audio is clipped in the hi-fi stereo, and it's simply backing over to the um, maybe to the mono, um, but it sounds like the mono track is output. This this is kind of something that would happen. Some VCRs, depending on which ones you get, don't have the ability to switch between the two. It's just auto. And it sounds like if you clip or distort, you know, it, it'll tell that it's distorted. You'll just see the signal's distorted and just automatically falls over onto the mono one. Usually the mono one is usually recorded probably 6 dB lower. Um, if you have like a more advanced one that has meters on the VCR itself, sometimes you can actually, on the remote controller on the VCR itself, you can switch between mono and stereo, and that'll switch you over to the high, the higher quality stereo track that's muxed with the, uh, with the video. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I think Carl nailed it perfectly. It's probably switching over to the mono track uh, on your VCR. You know, high frequencies uh, aren't going to damage the output of your VCR. They could damage your tweeter and your speakers if they're used for extended periods of time. You can blow the coil, I mean, you know, blow the drivers in them. But uh, that's very, very rare, and you'd have to do it for a long period of time. So I think Carl nailed what the problem is there. Next question. Paul Valhus in Austin, Texas. What's the difference between Visor, New Tech, and NDI? How are these three brands interrelated? Go ahead, Grant. Uh, yeah, so um, there's a there's a few differences. VizRT is a is a big company that's been around for a long time, and they actually bought New Tech out. Um, and uh, and New Tech was um, has been like the the manufacturer of of uh, TriCaster is probably their biggest well known product. Um, going back to Video Toaster and things like that they had back in the day. Um, but uh, NewTek also designed um, uh, NDI protocol, um, which they I, I think actually kind of started out as the IVGA um, was a protocol that they had um, initially and, uh, and that kind of morphed into a, a, a more serious product, um, in NDI. And probably the smartest thing they did is kind of open source that, or, or at least, at least, um, not necessarily open source, but, uh, allowed, uh, um, people to take it and, uh, and, and have kind of created the SDK for it, for other products to build it into their products. And that's made a whole ecosystem now. Um, for NDI, but VizRT, um, the, the bigger company does some of those, uh, the cloud production software that is, you can see there's some crossover between new tech and, and, uh, and VizRT when they bought that out. Um, so there's, that's kind of the, the direction of that whole company. I'm a, I'm a big fan of, uh, of new tech. You have a, uh, a particularly good uh, video and audio today. So uh, did you change much? Did you change anything? I, I think it's this new hoodie that I that I it's got the for Father's Day. There's Father's oh. Day just on Sunday in Australia. <laughs> was that it? Was that it? Was it just the hoodie? I, I thought it was a new mic. I think mic, it's but... made all the difference. <laughs> it looks really he was good. wearing a onesie, but <laughs> anyway, uh, we uh, talked him out of it. There, there we go. Um, uh, yeah, VizRT is really, you know, before they bought into new tech, what, they were, what we knew them as is this giant graphics. So the lower thirds and the graphics for, you know, NFL football kind of thing. So really high-end uh, graphics, uh, 3D engines, uh, dynamic data flying into 3D engines. And so they're building that up. 
that's not a growing market. <laughs> like so, so they you know for VizRT, they were they're top of the top of there, but that wasn't a market that was going to keep on getting bigger. The people who have it have it. Um, it doesn't grow a lot between, and really the the future is where I'm sure that what they saw was that the future was where new tech was, which is lots of smaller shows. You know the the diffusion of the of the media market, and I think that they made a really astute uh, move to to absorb new tech. Uh, or to partner with New Tech, I'm not sure how they call it, but you know, buy it, partner, merge, whatever, whatever the word was. Um, but but have the two of them uh, added together, you know, definitely bring some tech from VizRT as well as uh, and money, <laughs> as well as uh, um, as well as really opening up their market to something that they just didn't really have access to. Uh, next question. Stan Chan from San Francisco, California. Stan asks, cleaning up my office, any recommendations for a storage system for all your wires and gadgets? Go ahead, Jason. Uh, this topic is near and dear to my heart because I just end up with so many little things. Um, on the cheap, I found that, um, that makeup compartments are really handy for adapters, like little makeup cases. And... Um, and tackle boxes actually work pretty well for um, for the little stuff. However, uh, when it gets to stuff like cables, forget about it. Um, you're much, much better off with um, something like um, a pegboard, which I've spent a lot of time today or yesterday um, working on my studio and installing. Good, Carl. Yeah, so I'm going to suggest go to IKEA, go to the website, go to storage and organization, and then start to go through. There's probably about two to 3,000 different items in there. Um, as you know, so as Jason said, like pegboards, they have those. They have small, like little tackle boxes, makeup boxes. They have all that kind of stuff as well. They actually have stuff for AV, so they do have a whole AV line now at IKEA, which is pretty cool. Um, a lot, I think, a lot of YouTubers have been uh, using their stuff, and IKEA's noticed this, so they're actually starting to make stuff. That they want YouTubers to put in their backgrounds and stuff like that. But yeah, IKEA just has thousands of solutions for storage and organization. You go ahead, Bill. And there are a couple of specialist things, too, that I found a lot of use for. One of them is um, it looks like a long metal piece that has kind of claws on the front of it. It's called a cable hanger, and you can get them from Marker Techs and company like them. I always like those for the cables that I'm using on a reasonably regular basis. So if I'm touching a cable every six months, but it's not in constant use, if I have to go over and get an XLR shorty or something like that, I will put it on that claw behind the door of the wall of whatever space I'm working in so that I always have some place to go get those wires. Gets a little inconvenient if it, it's a particularly long wire, you can coil it up a little and still hang it on that claw for, for quick access. Uh, if not, I tend to use a lot of shoe boxes for the smaller things. Um, and uh, when I say shoe boxes, you can get plastic ones from all sorts of companies on the internet that have good solid lids on them and are stackable. And that's kind of my go-to for the medium size things. I have an array of stackable boxes up on the top of the shelf of that. Uh, shelving unit you see behind me that's kind of how i take care of the medium size and small stuff which are really the biggest problems the long cables you coil them and put them up and, and you always can find them yeah i uh, for for how i the cable hangers are usually what i use for anything under six feet um so i try to have cable hangers that just have everything that i want in in those areas because it the, the rolling itself is not great for the cables and so especially when they're smaller and so leaving them hanging is, a, is just a lot easier way to get to them um, and, and, and to keep them in good condition anything over six feet i tend to roll i i have this little trick that um that a lot of people seem to think are, is interesting is that i put a two labels one right right by the um right by the the connector and one that defines the length of the roll so i go out we, we figure out what the what that length would be and it happens to be uh, uh, when you pull it over when you roll the whole thing it means that both connectors will be right next to each other so if you just follow that both connectors will be right next to each other and then when you wrap it with the uh, velcro they'll be together and there won't be uh, I don't oh like long, i love that I don't what like a good idea i don't like long oh. tails so so anyway so so they um so you just you just put the two connect you just put the two labels together and then you just wrap it up what's cool about it also is that you you can make them at different sizes and so that you have 25 feet and 10 feet and five feet so or you know so that they go into each other it's a really dense one that's a that's a story i've told before i'm always conscious of stories i've told before because grant's here and he always yeah. was, was, was that case. a good one was that a good makes story? Makes a heavy case, doesn't it? Um, it does. Alex, See, he's heard that story before. I didn't of, say that part. See, I left that part out yeah, of the story. It's a lot of copper. It's a lot of copper. It's a lot of copper. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, that's a that's a fun one. That's a fun way to uh, keep your things. When it comes to actual items, 
Uline is your friend. So Uline is, they make um, little ones with these little uh, tray, trays that go in and out. You can they'll have like a hundred little trays in there and they're really, really short. And I keep them in my garage and I keep all my small things in there, little labels on the front. And I put the small stuff in there. I don't like stacking things because I never get to them. So anything stacked on top of each other means the thing that under the top thing means I'm not going to go through it very often. So having everything in a um, U-line makes all these great shelves. And I'd rather have dense shelves with lots of things that, but everything is freely accessible from the shelf. See, that's a new story, Grant. I don't think I've told that one before. See, see I told you. Next question. Santa Bart Gaffney in Oconomowoc, Oconomowoc, I it's one day I'll get it correctly. Uh, he asked an uh, audio question for newbies. I've sometimes listened to the pre-show, and while panelists are checking in and meter checking their audio levels, they identify their audio chain. Please explain the function of each piece of gear. Go ahead, Mickey. So yeah, we usually start with a microphone. Microphone turns sound waves, vibrations in the air into uh, an electrical signal. Uh, very, very low at a very, very low voltage. We send, we usually send that to a preamp, which takes that low voltage signal and amplifies it into what we call line level. Line level is what audio hardware uh, usually expects. So, and once we have that line level, we usually send that into an A to D converter, which turns that analog signal into a digital signal then into an audio interface, which brings that digital signal into the computer. And uh, inside the computer, our set setups usually vary. Uh, I have audio hijack to add in some delay so that it matches my video. Um, although I think my video is a little, the frame rate's not great. Um, and then from audio hijack, goes to loop back to feed it out to Zoom. Go ahead, Javier. Yeah, adding on what Mickey says, you can also have, uh, after you transfer to line level, you can, uh, before you transform it to digital, some of some people have like analog process like compressors or equalizers, but in the analog part of the, before you convert it, you can also add process in the digital, but you can add it in the analog. Uh, and the first thing we say is, uh, I am this person speaking from here. So the first part of your audio chain is what you're going to record. So. The first part is a person and a room. So there's this, this sort of things in the room like diffusers and absorbers and all of that that can change the sound before it even gets to the mic. So that's like the first part of the chain. Good, Mitchell. Santa Bart, I've got a uh, microphone. By the way, my system's a little different. And then that goes into a Studio Technologies 205. Here, I can show you my chain. And that provides a uh, analog mute and it also... Uh, digitizes the microphone channel, sends it onto my Dante network, which I use for other stuff. Uh, the next device is an Aphex channel, which is a uh, preamp, um, EQ, uh, compressor, deesser, um, Aphex stuff. They've got a thing called Big Bottom and Aural Exciter, which I use very sparingly. Then that goes into my uh, Sony FX3, into the digital input, not the analog uh, input on the camera itself, which is usually pretty noisy. And then from there, it goes into my uh, ATAM, then into my M1 Mac and so forth. Um, that seems to be the system that works well for me. Go ahead, Carl. So yeah, so I've learned with office hours, keep things really simple. So I've, yeah, I've literally got my dynamic microphone. It's super cardioid side address. I'm um, usually used on guitar amps and drums and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going into a Flow 8. So Flow 8, we talk about that a lot, but the Flow 8 kind of handles everything that we, we just talked about as far as the preamp. It's got two very high quality inputs, number one, number two. Um, they have phantom power as well. But essentially it handles everything. And I simply, I go out of the um, USB out of the Flow 8 and it goes into the computer and the, the Zoom just sees a Flow 8. So I keep it really simple. And I also monitor through the Flow 8. So my in-ears are plugged into Flow 8 and the Flow 8 handles everything. I can control it via the app or I can control it via the hardware itself. But I've tried to keep this simple. Like I've got a lot of audio equipment, but I've kept this one really simple. So it just always works when I come to office hours and I don't have to think about it. Hashid? where no one's left behind is basically it right so let me take all the simplicity to this because we are hearing all these terms and to some listeners you might not understand these brands right so simple to say i have a microphone i usually like to have dynamic microphones so on my starting of my audio chain i usually like to mention mention the brand that i have so if anybody is listening in the pre-show or anything like that they're able to at least go 
check it out for themselves. Uh, analog wise, I do have a mixer, so I'm using a Yamaha MG10XU. Reason why I chose this device was the fact that it has uh, physical knobs, so I could turn up my gain, turn up my levels. I could make funny sounds with it, with the uh, effects that are built into the mixer. And the reason why I also say this is, again, we don't, we hear brands, we hear things thrown around like Flow 8. We've heard that, but what does it look like? And so I like to express it out for other listeners, maybe that, you know, they're in, in the market of buying a new device. I also do have a mute switch that I, I disregarded uh, quite a few times, but it's a uh, Proco mute switch. So you got to remember that you have to have two XLR cables to use a mute switch. One goes into the mute switch and then, then the other cable goes into your microphone. So that's one explanation there. And then with the webcam, it's just a simple USB Brio webcam. So when you look at the simplicity of things, as Carl also mentioned, you could stick a USB microphone into your computer and that is part of your audio chain. Make sure that your audio is coming through the microphone, but remember, you are also listening to stuff. So your speakers could come on, come from your microphone. So if you had a Samsung Q2U, you could have all your audio streaming right from the microphone as an interface and put it into your ears and you'll sound 10 times better rather than your laptop speakers. Next question. Javier Alfaro from Mexico City, Mexico. Not a lot of people watch social media content without turning the sound on. How important is it to give a great audio experience when they decide to turn it on? Go ahead, John. I think you're you're telling a story both visually uh, with whatever content you're writing as well as whatever they're listening to. Uh, so if your content is engaging, they're going to want to put it on. They're going to want to listen to longer forms of that content. Your audio is going to be very important to engage them for a longer period of time. It's one thing to watch a 30-second funny thing on TikTok. It's another thing to go to your YouTube channel and listen to you, you know, on a diatribe about something. They're most likely not going to read all that unless they want to, you know, go to a website and read a blog. Go ahead, Grant. Now, I think about uh, the way that we connect with people uh, is through sound, um, a, a lot of that. And I, and I think the better that the sound quality is, the more it feels like we're standing in front of that person um, and we're connecting with them. The more distant that sound is, no matter what the visual is, the more distant the sound is, the more our brain, the lower brain's going, well, what's going on? Why do they sound so distant? And then it creates a headache. You know, and so particularly for longer form, I think you want really good quality audio and it feels like you're, you're sitting right next to the person, you're connecting right with them. Good, Carl. So I think the, the next thing that's going to happen with some of these social apps is there's going to be, you have your audio track, you have your video track, and there's going to be a haptic track. So you'll be able to put into the haptics. So when your video is playing, you can actually control the haptics of the device you're on, so an iPhone or, or an Android phone. Um, I think that's been, on, it's in the works um, it's just got to, you know, it's just Apple and, and Google have to turn it on in the software to allow it to happen. But yeah, I think there's going to be a haptic track pretty soon because people are watching videos with no sound, but they still want to have an interaction. So I think haptics will be the next track. Yeah, the uh, I, I think that the reason we turn a lot of sound off, obviously, I mean, I have the problem with, I, I don't like sound. It's, it's been web pages are constantly turning the sound on. And it's been a real, like, that's the problem is when people roll video in a web page without me asking for that video is why I don't like sound. You know, like when I, when I, when I don't like it, it's because people have done horrible things with their web page. You know, like I'm going to now stick this in front of you and turn a bunch of audio on and everything else. And it's not exactly what I want, you know? So, so I think that it's, it's not that people don't want audio. They just don't want to be surprised by it. Um, and so a lot of things have been, you know, kind of forced off. I think it's the autoplay. It's really the devil here. <laughs> you know? And um, uh, I think that uh, we, we definitely, uh, I, I think that we, you know, because the problem is that fa for Facebook and a lot of these other things, they just assume you want to play, turn play on all the time. And then people hated that. And so then they, they said, well, we'll turn it on without any audio. So you can at least see it. The idea is to, of course, keep you there, you know, is, is the goal there. But I think that um, the audio, once they turn it on, as said before, I, I think it becomes even more important. Audio, I think, is still more important than video. I mean, flat out. Like, as someone who's been doing this for 20 years, audio is more important. It keeps people longer. It's why if there's one thing I'm going to send to a panelist that's going to be on a show, you know, that we're going to do, it's a mic. Like, I don't send a camera. If I have to choose between the camera and the mic, I immediately move to the mic. You know, um, and so that's the, because the audio is super important. People can listen to to people can watch bad video for a long time. Just look at 
you know, whatever it is today, in this day in internet or whatever, you know, today's do daily dose or whatever. It's not a really bad video. Um, but if the audio is bad, people won't watch for very long. Go ahead, Bill. Also, realize how much this factor, the fact that people turn it off, has changed the design of things like social media sites. As you are scrolling through things now, what you will see often is a well-designed splash page to things that has large type, tries to make ask a question or else somehow engage the viewer because they realize people are scrolling through and if they don't see something they want to see that causes them to stop and click on it, they're likely to just scroll past. So... I think that's partially driven by the fact that people turn sound and those kind of things off because they're so uh, disengaged with the annoyance of this. And that means that your design of your splash pages and things like that becomes all the more important. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of us have, have just gotten overwhelmed by notifications. You know, so I think that a lot of us have turned off. I have my all my systems turned to do not disturb all the time, like not, not, not some of the time, but all the time. Um, I don't have any, I don't want anything to make noises that I don't expect. And it's mostly just because it's just really hard to concentrate. Um, and I realized that I was much more calm, you know, when I could just go find things when I'm, when I'm good and ready to find them, <laughs> not, not, uh, not have them constantly jumping out at me. So I think that, I think that we went too far and I think that's part of the problem. Next question. Chris Widener from Lafayette, Indiana. It looks like to get a mini PC with Thunderbolt, I'm looking at an Intel Nook. I think that's how you say it. Any suggestions for one that could do as a 1080 client Zoom room that could be 12 volt powered easily? Go ahead, Courtney. Well, there's lots that can be 12 volt powered and can work as a, uh, a 1080p Zoom room. Uh, B-Link makes a number of i5 and i7 based in some Ryzen 7 and Ryzen 9 NUX uh, that will work if you're hung up on the Thunderbolt. Um, you know, there's the Intel nuc 12 extreme but it's not i don't think it runs on uh, 12 volts and it has a lot of cooling and it does have thunderbolt 4 though if you're hung up in the thunderbolt uh, that may be your only choice to go to the intel nux uh, most of the others uh like the b links or the um, melees uh, that have uh, quad core intel processors that are uh, multi-threaded uh, which is what it's going to take. You need at least four cores multi-threading to be able to deliver the 1080p thanks to uh, uh, Zoom's uh, discrimination against quad-core uh, processors, uh, with even with uh, good graphics coprocessors. Um, if you can settle for USB 3.1 over USB-C, there's a, a number of choices out there. The, um, the B-Link makes a an i5 for around 500 bucks that has all the ports that you need on it, uh, with the exception of Thunderbolt 4. Go ahead, Grant. Yeah, just a, I'm a big fan of the NUC. Um, I've I've got uh, I've had a few of them. I've got one that I use as a Zoom room um, with three outputs, and uh, and it's running a Display Link. Um, it's it's five years old uh, i7. It runs a display link, um, and that's doing three 1080 outs. Um, it works great as a Zoom room. Um, and I bought it, you can buy them often bare bones, where they you, you've got to put RAM in them and, and put a hard drive in them. Um, it's quite a cheap way of doing it, and, and uh, then you can put uh, often an M2 um, uh, hard drive in them and make them really fast. And they're great little size. I think they're 19 volt, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the actual transformer on them, but... Um, so you might need to do some inversion there or or something. But apart from that, maybe a, maybe a a, a laptop might be a, a better way, um, and you could run it off Uf yeah you know, UFC. I was going to say you can't run it off mixed martial arts. Um, you could run it off of I mean, USB. I mean, if you if you had some little generators in there, you know, like the <laughs> you know on the wrist or something, it could generate a lot of. <laughs> Yeah, but a battery bank or something, you could probably run it off and, and that would give you um, double backup power. Next question. Guy Cochran from Seattle, Washington, and right here on the panel. Did Sony just release a new E-mount PTZ for $9,699? John? Looks like they did. It looks like they took a, a alpha frame body and put it into a PTZ head. Uh, from what I'm reading here, looks off a looks like off a B&H photo of 4K 120, E-mount lens, 4K full frame sensor, 12G SDI, HDMI, uh, POE as well. Uh, looks like an interesting camera. Go ahead, uh, Carl. 
So yeah, so the maximum you can take though is a seventy to two hundred. Anything larger than that, you have to lock it off. You know, pan and tilt. It has to be locked off. So Sony won't allow anything larger than a seventy to two hundred. So if you're trying to use this at the back of like a an auditorium or something and you want to zoom right to stage, this is not the camera because you know it's full frame. So but why the way they're using it is on, on a crane. So they're putting it on a crane and essentially using it as like a um semi clock or like a Ronin. So it's quite interesting how they're they're kind of marketing this. They are saying that it's used for certain things, but having like a full frame sensor means you're not going to be able to get the long throw from the back of an auditorium. But what you can use it for is some pretty creative um, low light situations, I think, because it, it does have, you know, it's essentially it's, a, it's an FX3 kind of sensor, FX6. Um, the other thing that it's, it looks like it can, it can't do internal raw recording, but you can, re you can record out to um, ProRes raw. So out to like an Atomos Ninja or something. So it can do raw, but it won't do it internal. Um, it does do high speeds, so you can get up to 240 frames a second, which would be good for sports and stuff like that. Um, it'd be interesting to see how this works live um, and if you can control how smooth it is. So that's the other thing, because once you put a 70 to 2, you need, you need big glass on it to kind of use it. So you're putting on some of the bigger powered zoom lenses that Sony've released. Um, they're going to be heavy. So it'd be interesting to see how the motors handle that and do smooth motion. Sorry, I'm just kind of, I'm jumping through it. Yeah, so I, I, yeah, I don't think it's, I, I will admit as someone who, who had, has owned a lot of PTZs and almost never put them in the back of a room, uh, you know, or, or in a sports environment, um, I think that this, they're, they're going to sell as many of these as they can make. You know, like this is, this is definitely a um, massive product by Sony. And this is what Blackmagic should have done about three years ago, four years ago, five years ago. You know, this is what we've been asking for. You know, like this is, and, and again, it's not, it's not about, to me, this camera is not about sports. I mean, I think the filmmaking is a little bit of a stretch, to be honest with you. I think that, that what they're showing it for, and I think that that's partially positioning. So people who are going to put it into their studios, let's say their home studios, I mean, like as a, for the YouTubers, this is a big deal. Like, you know, if you're doing home, you know, streaming from your house or doing multicam or whatever, being able to tie this thing together and have it look the way that you expect it to look as a creator um, is, you know, the, the $10,000 is fine, you know, as far as the price goes. Um, you know, we're talking about this is the same price as the BRC 1000, I believe, or, or maybe a little less than the BRC 1000. And the image quality is going to be dramatically better. Now, if you want to do corporate events and stuff like that, you probably stick to the older PTZs. But what this provides is a real way to, um, you know, put put the camera in places that you can't put the operator. So I think that's what they're trying to show in the in the demo that they have here is putting it where the, you can't put an operator. Um, putting, um, you know, you now take a simple jib and you have one of the big problems with jibs are the heads. <laughs> the heads of the jibs are kind of a constant source of, you know, like you have to figure this all out. Now you can buy a jib without theoretically, you know, if you're a small filmmaker, not a, not a big one, you know, the techno crane in that case. But if you have a small one, if you're a small filmmaker, the ability to have a great high quality head, um, you know, on top of, on the end of a long stick is, is a, is, is really transform, transformational. So I think that this is gonna be, I don't think it needs to go have longer lenses. I don't think it needs to have, you know, those types of things. I think that it's going to solve a very specific problem that no one has solved up until now. Um, and I think that uh, this is gonna be, again, I think that they'll sell, I think the biggest problem we're gonna have is getting them because I think that anybody who understands what these are, you know, in, in this environment, I think will be super interested. I mean, I this is the kind of thing that makes me, even though I like, all my systems to be one brand so that they all work together. I have to admit that this camera has me thinking about what, what I want to use in my office, you know, for my, for my main camera, uh, as opposed to the 6K, because this is what, again, this is what hopefully this goads, go, goads black magic into, you know, going down this path. Go ahead, Grant. Yeah. Well, speaking of black magic, I, I, I don't understand their PTZ control um on the control surfaces you know like they they have that there they've got a button they've got the joystick it's all there ready ready for them to go and then oh you want to use that oh you need to get an arduino you need to mess around with that it's like <laughs> it's sorry they what put in, i think they put it in long before they had any plans for it they're like we have to put a joystick in right now because we're building this gets into that whole like there's a sting button on our on our mini extremes that doesn't do anything like it just goes to nowhere um, and so in the same way they built the hardware before they built the when, when the first came out when the, when that joystick first came out it did nothing like we it was like 
future releases will do something, you know, with that with that button or with that arm. So, so I think that I think it's I think it's a pretty exciting um, thing. We're, we're going to do what we can to get these get Sony on to show us this a little bit more detail or, or have us get to test it. Um, but it's uh, you know, there's so many places where this will be useful. Like it's it's a pretty powerful. It's 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 really exciting. And if you look at the uh, interface that controls the camera, um, wow. That interface is like incredible. You know, you know, we I don't think we've seen a PTZ with that with that level of control um, out of the gate without a you know big piece of hardware. But the Panasonic hardware is great. The bigger one, the little one, not so much. Um, the the bigger one is is got some some great control over it. But they're you know being able to have it all on display that you can really touch it and move it and and have the the kind of heads up display that you're that we're kind of wanting to go towards. It's pretty pretty slick. So we'll we'll definitely dive more into this camera as it as uh, it becomes more readily available, and as soon as we can do an hour, either of us just showing it off, sampling it, or uh, or if if uh, you know if, if we can get them on, we'll we'll do that. All right, next question. And it's in from Douglas Carmichael. Douglas asks, I'm thinking of having a Yamaha Mod X6 Plus keyboard atop my Roland F Phantom 06. If I used a K&M 188 table stand, which he's got a link to, would sliding the Phantom 6 underneath the stand still provide me a stable plane surface? Go ahead, John. I would put whichever the heavier of the two keyboards are on the bottom, uh, just to make sure you have a good base, but using two keyboards with that stand is not a problem. Uh, go ahead, Doug Carl. Yeah, so the top keyboard is the one that's going to be a bit rickety because there's no triangles in the stand. So whenever you're doing these kind of stands and you want to get a bit of support, you want to get a triangle. So as you can see on the graphic now, it's actually just like an L bracket or more of a C, two C brackets that have like a crossbar that goes between them. So because of that, in theory, it can actually fold sideways um, and you're only relying. So you'd want to, you can actually purposely build like a cross bracket, like an X bracket to go at the back there. Um, but yeah, you want, you want to make some triangles there to make it a bit more um, stable. Next question. From Samuel Nordvik in Norway, what protocol would you use for sending commands from BitFocus Companion to an Arduino board? I'm trying to control an old pan tilt head. Go ahead, Grant. Uh, it's an interesting question. Um, I, I guess I would think about um, the how you will manage um, momentary um, uh, action, and so as you're as you're pressing a button. Um, I guess you, you you're probably using a stream deck, um, whether that's pulsing, um, or or whether you're doing a one one tap for a movement on the, uh, and so then how that will receive it in the Arduino. Um, my initial thought is is OSC or or um, uh, or MIDI. Um, MIDI could work, and you could you could interpret that. Um, you could do HTTP. Um, uh, requests, um, but yeah, you probably want something that pulses so that you can you can hold a button down and have it move, um, and potentially have uh, another option as to the speed that it goes. Um, so yeah, but but I think one of those will work. It's more your interpretation. So you, you're going to have to translate that, and um, you could use any any one of those protocols. I think. It's just more about the, the movement of it and the pulsing. Next question. And it's from Stan Chan in San Francisco, California. Any recommendations for a Dante Atmos receiver? Go ahead, Mickey. Uh, I'm not aware of a traditional home theater receiver that has a Dante. Uh, when I say traditional, one that has an amplifier in it that directly drives the loudspeakers. Um, though there is a, a home cinema processor, home cinema processor um, from a from JBL that is called the Synthesis line. Uh, though they are in the price range that um, probably uh, Nigel Dassault installs. So you're talking about five thousand US and up. Uh, but those are home theater cinema processors that have bounce outputs and also Dante outputs. Yeah, they're they're um I was just look trying to find the one that I wanted to. There's a couple different companies that make it. Now, Mickey, I guess a question for you is would a solution for this be 
Um, you could you use this wouldn't be this would be an expensive solution as Mickey was talking about. But could you put together something like uh, one of the 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 various AVRs that has XLR out, run that into something into like a Dante a, interface or or into a um, uh, X32. So you'd have the analog go out of the that into the X32, and then the X32 has Dante card. So that anything you want to throw to the X32 via Dante, you could do. And then the then it would go to powered speakers that that are taking XLR inputs. Would that yeah, system work? Um, absolutely, and you, you can um, you can also use that X thirty two as uh, as uh, your your monitor controller because you can right. use a DCA to adjust things together and also time your speakers using the delays. The only yeah. thing with that though is you are adding an extra D to A and A to D conversion um, stages within your right. pipeline. If you're a purist, um, you're, you know, you, ooh, don't do that, but you probably won't notice. I mean, like most of us, <laughs> m most, of, most of us won't, probably wouldn't, uh, won't notice that additional stage. But there'd be no other way to do it, I think, if you're trying to get Dante to, and the AVR. I, I, I guess the processor, you're, you're talking about the, the yeah, whole the processor. Yeah, pro the processor that goes that directly to, to Dante, yeah. Right, uh, next question. Donnie Estias from Manila. Can I use a Rode Wireless Go to send audio from an X32 output to a pair of inner ear monitors? Go ahead, Mickey. Uh, yeah, with the, and I'm just excited because we have Johnny back ask, asking questions. Um, with the with the X32 XLR outputs, uh, you have to make sure that you're only pulling pin one, sorry, pin, pin two, which is the hot leg. You want to leave pin three, which is the negative or slash cold leg uh, alone, totally drop that pin in your cabling. Um, and uh, from the X-ray two, you would also want to drop your output levels down quite significantly because something like a Rode Wireless Go would be expecting to get to, to receive microphone level. Now people have gotten away with sending consumer line level to it, but it doesn't like that. But, and, and with that professional line level is, uh, you're, you're already pushing the limits of the input gain stage of the wireless go. Good, John. One thing to take into consideration is latency. Uh, if it's for personal IM monitoring, that's going to be something that could cause issues uh, for anybody. Um, our, our eyes are much easier than our personal inside our ears. It just seems to uh, be much more sensitive to any sort of delay of what you're saying versus what you're hearing. I could, Courtney. Yeah, I would only use them as a last resort because they're A, they're not designed for carrying line level inputs and B, the receivers are not really designed as headphone amplifiers because they're not very beefy there. And C, they're line of sight and they operate in 2.4 gigahertz, which means that if you've mounted them on a person who's going to be walking around the stage, if they turn their back to the transmitter, they may lose their in-ear monitors or if they're you know in a situation where they're playing music. Uh, the music is going to overwhelm the outputs of those uh, into an in-air monitor because I just don't think they have enough beef to drive uh, a good good set of in-air monitors. Javier? Yeah, uh, yeah. Adding on what Courtney is saying, uh, as uh, the same that Mickey said that you have the, the it's expecting to get mic level uh, in spin. It's expected your earphones are expected to get a line level up. You, you need more more power. So the you need the the impedance of the earphone AirPods, sorry, of the earphones is gonna differ. So if you wanna try this hack, try a couple of different in-ear monitors, so like different uh, brands or different impedance, so that is gonna react different to the level coming out of the receiver. Yeah, and there are other, um, you know, there are other not super expensive versions of in-ear monitors that you could probably look at. I know one of the ones that um, some folks that I've worked with have used are the Mi Pros. Um, I don't know if anyone here has used the Mi Pros, but the Mi Pros are not, not super expensive, um, but um, I've seen them used in a couple studios relatively effectively with no real dropouts, and they're really designed for what you're trying to do. Uh, let's go to the next question. Paul Valhus in Austin, Texas. Obsidian versus Google Docs. Do they play well together? Which has the most robust app ecosystem? And can you mark down in Google Docs? I don't know anything about us. Obsidian. <laughs> so I think I don't, since no one else has done it, I, don't think, I think you're in an area that we don't know. All right, next question. 
Johnny Estias from Manila. Mukata question or feature request. Is it possible for producers to directly reply to other producers' questions on Mukata's web interface? Uh, yeah, you should be able to click on it and you can hit reply. So just click on the on the question as it's in the when it's in the actual chat and you should be able to add a thread there. Next question. Douglas Carmichael. Carl, you mentioned making a triangle with the stand. Would you recommend another desktop stand product for the Mod X6 Plus? I've seen some people use a pair of laptop stands for the Mod X6 Plus. And as we go into the uh, this answer to this question, just let to let the producers know, we probably have room for four or five more questions at least. And we've got a great panel here. So if you've got especially audio questions, go ahead and uh, throw those in. Um, go ahead, Carl. So with a, if you've got your synthesizer, let's say you've got a 61 key synthesizer on your desktop, you're going to probably have it on the keyboard slide out rack that's going to come if you've got that type of desktop. So that's where the workstation normally goes, like your Phantom. Um, any other keyboard I'd probably put on a dedicated stand. That is the floor standing stand. They're pretty beefy. They, you know, they have a cross X. You can get the monolith ones, which are the Z shape. Um, so there's, they're the better ones to get. Don't get the single pillar ones at the back that have like the, you know, the little V coming out. They're, they're kind of, they're pretty much late eighties, early nineties on the stage. They look cool, but they're not actually very stable. Um, if you, if you definitely want to put them all on the desk, um, probably building your own. So I'd say two better blocks and a nice thick piece of wood would be stronger than anything you could buy from <laughs> Sweetwater, to be honest. Um, so that would be my suggestion, but that's if you want to save real estate. But it's kind of it gets real tricky when you want to actually put these kind of like C brackets. That's that's what you're talking about a C bracket with a bar that goes across the back. Once you start doing that, then you start putting a pretty heavy synthesizer on top of that, or any pretty heavy equipment. It's going to want to fall sideways, and that's kind of the problem you're going to have. So you can actually make up your own X bracket between the back. You'll find there'll be holes where you drill your own holes. Just go to a hardware store and make a essentially it's a brace. So you just need two flat pieces, you know, so it's half an inch long and maybe you know about a quarter of an inch thick, and just make two braces, and that'll work. But, you know, a little bit of a, little bit of a hardware job for you. But um, you can use those C brackets. They do work, but, yeah, I'd want to put a brace at the back. Next question. Douglas Carmichael is back. The weekend, a.k.a. Abel Tesfe, canceled his concert at Los Angeles' SoFi Stadium after three songs because he lost his voice. What is the crew going to do with the unexpected loss of work and no fixed restart date? Go ahead, Courtney. They're going to look for other work. Um, most of the crew uh, is probably on a union. That's a union crew probably at SoFi Stadium. Uh, so they'll be paid for the day, of course. Um, they may not be paid more than one day because most union contracts these days are usually on a day-to-day -day basis. And you can be laid off at any moment and you're not expected to get anything else unless you have a contract outside the union contract that covers you for a period of time for like run of show or for a week on a weekly basis. So um, if you're hired on a weekly rate card, then you would get paid for the rest of the week. Um, and then you could be looking for other work. All this is going to be covered probably by insurance, uh, depending upon what kind of uh, insurance they carried for a big show like that. Of course, they got to pay the venue. They booked the venue out for a number of days. That's a much bigger chunk of money than uh, the few people that are working on the crew. So uh, they would probably be paid out of the insurance. Or a lot of times, if it's a fairly deep pocketed performer, they will offer to cover the cost of the crew for the rest of the tour or something that they had to cancel. Uh, if they're fairly big hearted, but under, under union contracts, they're not obliged to. Good, Mickey. Yeah. And just to add to what the Courtney mentioned, if, uh, the, if, if the crew member is not a freelancer or a day player and they're directly hired by the tour, uh, the, it would basically depend on your contract with the, with the tour, uh, each person has, you know different uh different scales or or um stipulations within the con contract that state how you know, how many days or weeks they are guaranteed to be paid whether or not the show happens um and also if the the um technician or or the crew member is uh, is an employee of say the the supplier of the of the equipment the rental house then that's not their problem it's the it's a rental house that uh, deals with that and the production. Yeah, and a lot of it has to do with relationships as well. So it also depends on where you are in the food chain. <laughs> so if you have some of the top camera operators and some of the top 
uh, 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 mixing and so on and so forth. A lot of times, the, the, whoever's producing this is going to pay a lot of people some cancellation. It might be in their contract, but even if it's not, sometimes they'll get paid for it because um, if they don't, you might not be able to get them back. You know, especially folks that are sitting behind the, uh, you know, the the, the uh, lead audio. Oftentimes, there's like I mean, in the United States uh, for events that big, there's only a handful of people that do that and they all know each other. <laughs> so, so if you, uh, if you cut them off, uh, you, you may have a hard time. It's, it's beyond a contract. It, it may be hard to dig out of that. Um, you know, I see the same, when we work on really big shows, I see the same guys sitting behind the, the board, um, most of the time. And so, so, and they all know each other well. And so it would, you know, you, you don't want to get yourself turned inside out there. If you're just moving stuff around, you know, if you're your labor, yeah, you're going to probably be looking for something the next day. Uh, next question. Grant Whitehead from Adelaide, Australia. Alex, can you expand on your tweet this morning? Yeah, every once in a while I see something where you see a bunch of actors that are, you know, like really high profile actors. And, and I'll show you what, what caused the tweet um, here. I, I just, uh, let me see if I can uh, bring this up here. Um, so this was Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. Um, doing something with uh, the Brendan Fraser, and and you just look at it, and you're like, really? You have these actors. This is a this is a basically a facade sitting over top of a Zoom room, you know. Um, so they're they're having a Zoom. In addition to the fact that they're not paying attention to camera angles on major actors, and they've got stuff in the back. I mean, they they're just. It's at some point two years into this, I'm going to start calling it out. <laughs> like, you know, I didn't, I didn't put the picture up there. I thought that was nice just to say that it was a problem um, uh, rather than calling them out directly, but I'll call them out here in the show. It's pathetic. It's pathetic. You know, like, like, you know, to, to just put a facade over top of a zoom meeting. Uh, and, and I think that uh, as, as we continue to go down the path of building higher end events, we have to defend the space, you know, and so we'll, we will get much more aggressive about this because people who do what that they did there, um, that undermines our ability to do virtual events. You know, like it, it because people see bad examples of it, um, poorly done. And, you know, the tools are, you know, with things like Zoom ISO and Zoom OSC and the, you know, NDI and all the other things that are available, there's just no excuse for it anymore. And we're gonna stop giving people excuses for it. And this is the beginning of me probably bashing someone about once a week you know, for doing what they're doing with virtual events, because we need to protect the space. We need to be, say, basically, if you're going to do a public event with, you know, a virtual event and you don't do it well, expect to be called, called to the mat. You know, um, I'm not going to go after people who have some kind of major technical difficulty that any of us could have had, but just bad design, you know, and we have to, you know, make that, make bad design not a safe place, you know, you know, and, um, and so in this area, so this is, this is my, my warning. <laughs> you know, this is my merry message, you know, is, is to, uh, uh, to, to let people know that I'm going to bring back the teardown and we're going to put it back on there and we're going to start aggressively going after people. You know, I, so with the teardown, it's, it's on the pixel core YouTube channel and it was, I start, this is, I, I stopped doing it cause it was just, it was taking a lot of work to do it. And, uh, and then we moved on, I moved on from the pixel core site. And so, uh, it, it was me going after broadcast of not so much broadcast, like researching it, like, look at what they did. This is good. This is bad. This is like, look at what, why they did this and everything else. And so I tore, tore stuff down. I did it as a plan to start going after uh, web stuff, you know, so that I could start pushing that forward. And I, but I didn't want to start there um, because it felt like it was, you know, um, you know, anyway, so it, it, so, but I think that we're going to come back to talking about broadcast of what we can learn. Um, talking about things that aren't working, but really making it unsafe to do bad virtual events, you know, I think is something that people have to start. I mean, what, what's happened is, is that we all think we can do it for $10, you know, and so the part of it is, 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 is that, again, uh, we need to look at, you know, all these, you know, cheap producers who hire some Yahoo who's going to put a facade that's sitting over top of, of this and they're doing it for, you know, one tenth of anything that they ever spent on a on a real event, and and they think that that's okay. And you know, my message for them is, we're coming for you. <laughs> like like you know like you know this is going to be on Twitter. This is going to be on. And our job, I'll put up the posts if you guys want to put them up too. I'll retweet them. You, but we all need to start putting them up and retweeting them. Of like, this is not okay. You know, and because what happens is, is you embarrass the people who do these. 
and they start looking for better solutions, you know, and so we're going to, you know, um, we're coming out, you know, because, you know, knives are coming out, you know, because we just can't keep on putting up. I'm just tired of watching these. And, and it just, it hurts all of us when people do those kinds of events. Um, next question. Beware, be very aware. Our next question is from John Wallace in Pontiac, Michigan. Has anyone looked into Project Shasta from Adobe and AI voice processing technology? Go ahead, Mitchell. Um, I have looked at it a little bit and in general, AI voices and as a voiceover artist, um, I think that uh, it's not quite there. It's not really ready for prime time because what uh, the AI does not uh, do very well is the little subtleties, uh, the little pauses, the continuity of the read, uh, the little uh, uh, side remarks that need to make it more human. Um, I'm sure it'll get there someday, but for now, I don't think that it's something that you, that as a voiceover artist, I'm concerned about. Go ahead, Courtney. I just briefly looked at it. It's um, interesting where they're using AI to convert speech to text, and then you gives you a, a transcript, and you can edit the transcript, and then it will go back and edit the tech, edit the voice, and uh, it will also do, uh, you know, it'll fix up the, your sound and analyze your sound and make it sound a little better. I don't know, think it's necessarily creating an AI voice. Maybe I missed that part, but I haven't had a chance to listen to the whole thing. Uh, it seems more like it's using AI tools to tune the quality of your audio and help you adjust uh, your settings. Although it is, says it's all done in the in the web, so it's web based. It's all done in the cloud, so it'd be interesting to see. Uh, it's taking the audio in from whatever audio device you're feeding it in with, and then processing it in the cloud and putting it together into an edited piece uh, in the cloud. Go, ahead, John. Yeah, what I was seeing was um, for noise reduction, it was actually replacing some of the parts it couldn't uh, replace with uh, with an AI voice and leveraging everything it knows about the recording that it has to try to replace that. Well, um, it sounded pretty good from what I could see. Uh, it definitely takes away some of the um, robot portion of the AI voice and just leveraging all the inflection that you're giving it and then just kind of replacing that with a clean signal. Uh, definitely interesting uh, and definitely not happening in real time yet. Go ahead, Bill. I just kept thinking about our friends at Lumberjack. They've been doing something similar, one piece of this. Now, obviously, with Adobe's resources and reach and deep, deep pockets, um, they're going to try to take this to the next level. I, I kind of agree with some of the notes we've had. I'm not sure whether... Uh, trying to replicate human performance through artificial intelligence is ever going to be uh, ever going to cross that uncanny valley and become mm -hmm. really uh, transparent. Right. But I'm happy they're doing research in it because if nothing else, it's going to maybe make the people who have some sort of uh, auditory disability, maybe this technology will, will manage to make things easier because they're putting a lot of money into this, hoping to commercialize it. Fingers crossed. Yep. Next question. Next question in from Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh, PA. Dante Audio opens up a lot of capability and flexibility, but not at an insignificant investment expense. What does the panel feel is the threshold function where a producer should start looking to transition to Dante? Go ahead, Grant. Uh, my use case is in this studio. Uh, I've got no less than six or eight uh, computers that I that I use for events. Um, doing Dante for that has been game changing. Um, using an X32 with a Dante card, yes, that was a big um, investment, relatively, um, to get that going. But but once I did that, now I don't need individual interfaces on every one of those computers. And and now I'm doing more than just two channels in and out of each one. I can do multiple channels in and out. Um, that flow um, is is really game changing. So for that type of um, multiple computers where you have a single task that it's doing, being able to route audio in and out just over the Ethernet is is amazing. Go ahead, Mickey. As, as a sound engineer, I think my threshold is a 16-channel snake. I wish to never haul anything larger than a 16-channel snake, snake again. Um, but as a producer, uh, if you are one to, if you are a producer that is willing to give in to or not, maybe not the right word, but willing to uh, offer, la willing to say yes to last minute requests, the speed and flexibility that Dante uh, allows you to make changes in the routing. 
uh, is a game changer in that end. Um, yeah, that's about it. 16 Channel Snake. No. <laughs> Last question for the first hour. Johnny Estias from Manila. I've been studying and using Dante for the last year or so, but I'm struggling to understand flows. Can anyone explain the concept? Go ahead, Mickey. So each Dante flow is capable of carrying up to four channels of audio at 48 kilohertz. Every, every single transmission you do from one Dante device to another is a flow, is a complete flow, no matter if you only send one channel or the, the full four channels. It is a flow. Different Dante chipsets have different capabilities in the number of flows they can take in and also push out. Say, for example, uh, a Dante, an Audinate Avio adapter is only capable, capable of two flows. So if you need to send a source, uh, a, a, an Avio source to a lot of destinations at the same time, more than two destinations at the same time, then you would need to turn that flow from a uni, unicast flow into a multicast flow. There we go. That's a good start. We probably could do another uh, second hour on Dante. We, I think we did it a long time ago, but I think it's time for us to bring another one up. Enough of us are using them. All right. We are changing subjects to our second hour, and we're really excited to have Chris Bain here uh, from Ave. Um, uh, in, uh, and, and they are the makers of Canvas, which is a fairly, a fairly new product here, at least new for us. Uh, I saw it and, and immediately reached out and was like, hey, do you guys want to be on the show? I want to see what this thing does. <laughs> so so <laughs> it looks really great. Uh, Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm really excited that to be here. And um, uh, thanks for having me on. So um, I'm excited to share the software with you and uh, feel free to interject at any time if I have uh, if you have questions or anything like that. So um, I'm going to give a quick overview of the software and we'll go through a um, little bit about me. Uh, my name is Chris Bain and I am a professional sound designer and composer for the most part. Um, although in the last five years, I've been mostly a professional software developer. So I've spent most of my career as a sound designer in theater. So doing lore regional um, theaters and installations uh, around the country. So um, that's sort the, of my background. How What's did you that? make the transition? How did you make the transition from uh, designer to uh, programmer or developer? I've sort of been programming my whole life. And uh, I think as a designer nowadays, you have to understand software and technology right. to an extent in order to be able to accomplish anything. So like even the basics of like an Arduino programming language or like a processing language is, um, is necessary to accomplish some, some really basic things and Matt, you know, things like max MSP make it simpler for you. Right. Um, Absolutely. So, and so, and this, how, when did you start working on canvas? So I started working on Canvas about five years ago. Um, I realized that a lot of the software that was out there was sort of missing the point. Like it was missing some of the features that I wanted in my work. And um, I what, was What were seeing, those features? What were the key features? Oh, I, I could go into it for days. I mean, things, simple things like editing audio, uh, collaboration on, on multiple machines, um, being able to move audio easily from speaker to speaker. Um, the list goes on and on. Right, right, right. Um, be, for me, the big thing about the technology and what we were doing in creating stuff was um, we would wind up fitting the technology or the scene to the technology, whereas I wanted the technology to work with the scene. So right. I would do productions where I would write a piece of music and I would then have to, we'd get into tech rehearsals and things like that. And I'd have to render down and force an actor to fit my music instead of being able to manipulate the music or manipulate the sound to fit the scene and what they are doing on a daily basis. And so what I felt was, is that we are, you know, by limiting ourselves in that technology, we then, uh, miss the point of live theater, which is the liveness of it, right? It's the the interaction between an audience and a performer. It's that, you know, we have a more quiet audience one day and a more loud audience another and allowing that actor, actor performer the ability to flow with it um, instead of locking into a scene, so to speak. Right, right, absolutely. Um, and uh, so you started five years ago, you started building this out. Where where are you at right now with the, with the software? 
So we released version one uh, about five years, uh, well, right before the pandemic publicly released it. And then of course the pandemic hit. And so we took a step back and we said, okay, what are the things we wanted to see uh, in the software in the long term? And so we rebuilt the whole thing from scratch about two years ago, starting about two years ago. Um, so we're on version two at the moment. Um, what did you change version... like for, for the rewrite? Why did you rewrite it from scratch? The biggest issue, there's two big issues. The major one being um, uh, collaboration between multiple machines and distributed audio systems. Mm -hmm. um, so allowing multiple machines to work together on the same network. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing being accessibility. So um, being able to allow a user to work with it on Windows and work with it on Mac or work with it on whatever machine that they're comfortable with. So, and what did um, you start with? What was it? Was it was it first a Mac app or a PC app? Or yeah, it was first a Mac app. So it was written in their language, and Mac tends to lock a lot of things down, and so it's really hard to then branch that out. So we spent a lot of time. It was on my goal from the beginning. I had a hope that they would take their new language. So they have a language called Swift. I don't know how techni oh, yeah. how technical yeah, you want me to get into the programming pretty, language. Um, and there was the hopes that when it started, that it would wind up being cross-platform and open it is open source language but um there was the hope that it will wind up being cross-platform and ultimately we wound up realizing that that's not going to happen <laughs> well and i think one of the Reality. hard things there is that is that you um that apple hands you a lot of things you can say give me the audio and and, and, if, and you want it to you want the operating system oftentimes to do as much of the work as possible because it does so much in av so um that's the challenge of making it cross-platform is that it's hard to do do that on both sides Yes, at the end of the day, there was a major rewrite of the audio engine. Like uh, we were using a lot of the core audio features, but mm -hmm. when you're not on core audio anymore, you have to, I mean, inevitably, if you're on Mac, you're using core audio somehow, but right. if you're not on core audio anymore, you have to write it to your own engine. Yeah. So playback is rewritten, uh, mixing is rewritten, like it's all its own processor yeah. at this point. So yeah, absolutely. Well, do you want to, um, are you able to show it to us? I don't know if we have, yeah, I'd love to share screen yeah. and, and give you an it. overview of the software. Um, yeah, absolutely. Let's see if I can get this going. All right, you just let me know if I'm in the wrong place or doing the wrong thing. Where is it? Okay, so you can see my screen? Yes, yeah, we can see okay, it. Cool. So um, I'll just go ahead and launch the software. Um, so this is Canvas. Um, we're currently in beta, so we are, um, and you can find us on our Discord um, or on our website at Avedio. Um, you, we are currently pushing everyone through the Discord to get the download because we, since we're in beta, we would like everybody to um, provide their feedback and their ideas so that we can um, build the software for people and not just for ourselves. So um, we'll go ahead and create a new workspace. Um, I'm just going to call it untitled for today. Um, it'll request that you uh, get a new user. So I'm just going to say I'm on here. Um, and it'll launch ourselves an engine and a server. And we'll go ahead and launch the view. I usually go into advanced views. So this is the basics of where you'll start with Canvas. And it, it's pretty empty at the moment. Um, in Canvas, it's very similar to a lot of these nonlinear softwares that you're used to. So um, things like Max and Isadora and um, those kinds of softwares where we have a number of different types of building blocks that you can use in order to be able to create the show that you want to create. So we have three different um, categories. One is control, um, one is uh, audio, one is external. So control is going to be things like sliders and buttons um, or control logic. Audio is going to be things like playback, so multi-track. DAW playback, plugins, delays, panners, mixers, et cetera. And then externals are going to be things like timecode, OSC, link, and MIDI. Um, so just to give you a quick hit start, um, you can do things like drop in a trigger and this can fire things. Um, we can pull in an audio file, for example. I'll just go ahead and pull in a quick, uh, let's see, let's do this guy. Um, piano uh, song and you'll see it's created a multi-track for us and we can see that multi-track down here in our tabs at the bottom and it's gone ahead and created the audio file um, and we can hit play actually i'm just going to go ahead and since we're starting from scratch i'm going to make sure that we can all hear it um and so 
Hopefully you can hear that. We can hit play on it and that will do it, um, get it started. So if I hit the play button here, um, I can then wire up this trigger to that multi-track and hit play on that. And that's gonna basically send a fire command down this line and tell it to do the thing. Um, I can then do things like add in multiple okay. audio files to and then either that, this, yeah, and go that ahead. trigger then can be activated. So that's where you might put in a OSC command or a time code, time code command into the trigger. Exactly. Uh, well, not into the trigger itself. What I would do is then cascade it. So if I wanted to trigger from OSC, I could then have the OSC trigger that trigger, which then triggers two different elements. So if that then fired, it would trigger this trigger. It's going to fire both of those elements at the same time. Um, that way you can do things like have uh, an OSC control a queue, but at the same time, you can have your user control a queue. So we could do things like mm -hmm. add this key, this trigger to a queue list over here on the, the right. Um, just widen that up. I did that by, there's a couple ways to do this. You can add to queue list or you can uh, control option, click on any element and it will add it to the queue list. So then that trigger is now in your queue list and you can go ahead and fire it and it will run the way that you're used to. So um, to me, this is really powerful because you can sort of segment out your ideas and concepts and wire up the ones you want to keep or, you know, unwire them or have them controlled via different ways. So if I wanted to both run it off an OSC or if I wanted to run it off a time code, I could have it actually fire that trigger multiple ways, right? So this, this will be either or, like whatever I have that set to, it'll, if either of them send a command, it'll, it'll trigger. It'll trigger it exactly. Now the control system is a little bit more complicated that, than that. Um, it does. It's not just about triggering, right? So mm -hmm. every parameter in Canvas is controllable. So, for example, you can see here that we have given you three different ports into your multi-track, um, and this corresponds here in this actions tab. And so you have three different ports here that we've gone ahead and given you when you launch, and each of those ports can be programmed to do anything. So we could stop the element, we could pause the element, we could toggle a mute on the element. So if we wanted to mute it or, and unmute it, um, if we wanted to affect a level. So if we wanted to change the main level of it, we could have the trigger change the level of the element or uh, fire a fade in. Um, so for example, one of the things that I, we will do a lot is, you know, I'll go ahead and add this to the queue list. Um, I'll have it trigger that fade in. And then I'll add a, the, it again to the queue list. So the queues just target these elements and I'll have it trigger the fade out. So then um, it will, I have two queues, one is a fade in and one is a fade out already pre-built for us. So we can tell these control systems to do whatever we want to with it. Um, and this gives us into the ability to add things like sliders. So if we had an OSC, um, I'll add another channel to this and I'll have this one affect the main level. And so I can have it, this slider affect the main level here. And so if I'm in the mixer tab, you can see that it's going to change our level. So, so what you're doing there, I just want, I just saw something go by that was really cool. Um, so you have a, you have a node um, uh -huh. there. And then when you, you, in a drop down there, you added another input for that node, another variable that it was going to receive. So yeah. the nodes don't come kind of pre-built. You're adding, you're just basically in this, uh, if you're selecting that node, you can be adding these um, in that lower right left or in this yeah. in this area here you can just add another uh, variable that it's looking for is that correct that's exactly right and we call these channels so um each uh element can have as many control channels as they want on input um and then output channels will be created based on the kind of element cuz like you know, there's only certain so many things you want from an element. So right. um, we automatically create the output outputs, but you get to add as many inputs. What's really cool about this is this main level, I could actually ha add additional parameters to that channel. So each channel can have as many parameters as it would like. So if I want this to actually affect the input level as well of this track, so channel one of this track, I can then set that and have that affect both the input and the output level. And you can see it affecting the input down here. So um, so you can have one control system operating multiple parameters in an element or changing multiple parameters in an element. And then also at the same time, we can have it so that this slider is affected by an OSC queue. So the slider will then take an OSC in and convert it to you know the levels to change the levels of the thing. So you could have an operator with a, a control board sending OSC signals into the 
to canvas to control the levels of multiple elements if you wanted. And, so and the could, little the, the little circles there are those are controlling the Bezier curve. Is that correct? The on the um, on the on the wires between them. Oh, that, so these are just um, options that you get to see. So if you wanted to change the colors of them, can you um, pull them? Can you reorder them? I mean, like move, change their shape. Uh, those... Yeah, there's a way to do that in your preferences. You can change whether they are line curved or straight at the moment. Uh, the thing that most people do is actually use them as flags. So we can actually turn them off, not turn them off, but like they'll flag themselves. So you can have multiple things going to oh. it and not clutter your system with a ton of lines. Um, it, to me, that's easier to deal with in general, just because mm -hmm. um, it cleans a lot of things up, but sometimes you do want to see stuff happen. Um, mm -hmm. On control lines, you can, um, let's do it here. You can actually add wait times to them. So you can add, you know, a three second wait and you'll see it count down here in the middle. Um, oh, so that's even another parameter. It's like, it's saying I'm in the wire. I'm going to slow it down until, mm -hmm. it get, until it gets there. Really yeah, exactly. Exactly. So um, with the control system, this, uh, this opens up the possibility of basically doing whatever you want with it, right? So like, however you want to build your cues or build your show, um, this is what it gives you. The, um, and to me, this is the most powerful part of the software is the ability to hook things up to other things. So like, um, one of the things we could do here is um, I'll just drop that line when this guy, when this piano is fired, I'll actually fire this one too, but with a three second wait. So we can do things like cascade. Right. Uh, so as soon as this guy's triggered, it's gonna trigger this guy. I'm gonna change it. Um, right. Things like that. So um, to me, that's sort of the most powerful part of Canvas, but there's a lot of different elements to this that also make it really powerful. So. Um, to go into a couple little details, um, unless there's like other questions as well. We, we have a bunch of questions stacking up, but we'll let you finish sure. a little bit. We've got, yeah, we'll, we'll be able to jump into the questions here in a couple minutes. For example, on the output side of the control system, we can drop in markers into our um, multi-track element here. Um, and while I'm on the multi-track element, it is actually a, an edib editable DAW. So you can actually come in here and, uh, you know, trim things and whatnot. Um, when we're playing the multi-track element, as we hit these markers, it'll actually send a bang out um, of these ports. So you can see it went ahead and added output ports per marker. So as we hit these guys in the timeline, it sounds horrible, my bad. Um, it sent a bang out here right. to this trigger. Um, I'll just mute that track because that's not useful. Um, so these kinds of things we can use to cascade it. Um, one of my favorite things that someone did was, um, there's a video I think on our YouTube where a line designer, sound designer used this in a dance piece. And so they had their piece of music and then just drop markers every time they wanted a light cue change. And it would just send a, you know, OSC command to the light console to yeah. um, change the cue. And so, as they did that, they could, you know, oh, that was late, that was early. All you have to do is come in here and just move this, right? You don't actually okay. have to time it out or write in like, oh, that's a 3.6 second fade time or mm -hmm. anything like that. You can just see it and do it. That's, that's hopefully right. the goal of a lot of this. Um, I, I'm gonna touch on one other point that I like as far as the elements and the audio elements is um, the panner element that we have. This enables you to be able to move audio. Um, I'm actually going to patch it to oh, this guy. So um, it's getting a little messy here. Um, the panner element allows you to be able to move audio between a single or a multiple input sources to output sources. So the relationship of the audio to uh, the input of this circle, the closer it is to center, the louder it is, right? So we can move audio between two channels um, pretty easily and draw paths to be able to move it. So if I sat here and... Um, you can hear it moving between your left and your right. Um, and we can have as many outputs as we want. So for instance, we had five, one, or 514, 714, that type of exactly. thing. Exactly. So we can come in here and, and set that up to be as many outputs as we wanted to. 
Um, and and then that then that data can also be pushed back out, right? I mean, so you could you could have the data of where that sound source is in that five one space, the X Y Z. Does mm -hmm. it, is it able to put that or X Y? I guess does does it do height as well? Um, yeah, there is Z in here. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's mm -hmm. is exposed. Yeah, let's see if it is. Uh, it's not exposed at the moment, but it does have the ability, um, which I'm happy to expose. But you can come in here and draw paths, uh, move them around. You know, so if you want your audio to move around between your sources, uh, you can come through and have it run on these paths. Uh, the the sources need, need to be bound to a path, and that's how you actually tell it to do these things. So you can have multiple paths, and then you tell the source to go to path one, and then you go to path two, and then you can move it around that way. Uh, hopefully that all makes sense. That's really the high level overview of it. Um, the, Anything else you want to show us before we jump into questions? We've got uh, yeah, I, I mean, there's a thousand things I, I want to show, I but um, I'm happy to pick up questions. Yeah, let's, uh, let's let's do a couple questions, and then if we have time, we'll we'll come back to some more more features. Let's go to the uh, let's go to the first question. First question in for Peter Belbin in Houston, Texas. Does Canvas provide a way to build custom user interfaces? At the moment, no. Um, your best bet is to build your control system right here. Um, so we hopefully give you as many of these little uh, elements that you want to be able to give to your user to be able to trigger. There is no like, um, what's the QSC or whatever that does that allows you to make. We it do it a lot of different like, ways. I, like this yeah. show, for instance, the show that you're watching here is run with an Is a, a universe front end and a Isadora back end. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so nice. Whole, so, so we nice. we uh, but we have and then that interface is the the universe front end that's talking to Isadora is completely you know obviously uh, adjustable. I think that's what he's kind of going towards. Yeah, I, a lot of this is you know at the beginning stages of the software. So yeah. you know if that is a feature that most people would want it's definitely something on our to-do list in the long term yeah it's so. definitely a big thing for us you know, we yeah. like to build we like to customize that interface to exactly what we want it what we want it to do just and only only expose what we need exactly. uh, next, next question next question in from daniel goldstein and uh, daniel asks are you considering a cloud-based application for canvas it would be great if it could if you could make sure it worked well on aws maybe with an api for control so the big thing right now is um, that we allow for collaboration over a local network and distributed audio systems over a local network. Um, what that means is that we can have multiple computers playing the same audio at the same time, um, either as primary or backups and as, or as like multi-room systems. Um, the problem with then putting audio on the cloud or any of this stuff on the cloud is, um, not really something we take into consideration when you're doing production audio because uh, internet can tend to be spotty and um, unreliable. So uh, at some point we would love to see some form of cloud at least saving and uploading uh, from there. But at the moment, no, there's not. Yeah, I think a lot of us, there's a lot of folks here that are doing cloud production. And so um, the, you know, all of them are sitting in AWS, you know, or not, not all of it, but so that they're all not going in and out of the internet. <laughs> they're just right. in, oftentimes in the same building, sometimes in the same computer. Um, uh, next question. Peter Belbin in Houston, Texas. Canvas UI seems to be heavily focused on a highly predictable sequence of cues. How might it be used for situations that are less predictable? For example, a radio show providing sports commentary. Uh, hopefully I've gone through some of the unpredictableness of it uh, that you can add to the software. Um, we try to, when you start with your, uh, with Canvas, we try to just give you the basic view of like what you're used to with a queue list and, you know, hitting queues into it. But uh, when you really get into the advancedness of it, you can build this however you want with as many triggers as you want. If you even got into things like, oh, today we're using a different person. Um, we have things like logic gates that you can enable, uh, you know, oh, this trigger is going to trigger X, Y, or Z, depending on the day, um, and even have things like a state mu machine where you can add different states, global states to the um, project and have triggers respond to those states. So if you wanted to get into that kind of stuff, you can, you can do great. it. That's great. Next question. Juan C. Robles in Mexico City, Mexico. How controllable is Canvas through OSC? Very. <laughs> um, 
anything can be controlled by OSC. We do have up in our help menu are all our OSC commands we currently support. So um, it doesn't seem like a lot, but every single input port gets is controllable via OSC. You can address it um, specifically based on um, which command is it? It's a element action here. So you can tell the input port of the piano here, this this main level to go to negative uh, 10 if you wanted to um, via OSC without having it connected up to anything. Next question. Next question in from Peter Belbin in Houston, Texas. Does Canvas provide ways to show status of interfaced equipment? For example, an OSC MIDI message that reports back the VU from the mix mixer or time remaining on an external playout device. Yeah, so um, there's a lot of different ways you can see this. Um, we do have a globals window, which allows you to see all the engines on your system, enable and disable different protocols, as well as main levels. Um, if you do go to your preferences window, you can see under each of the preferences, we have a input monitor and output monitor for OSC. Same for MIDI. Uh, link is not really built for that kind of thing, so that's not there. Um, but time code as well. You can see time code coming in and out. Um, I think I even have this as, uh, yeah, so time code will, I do have a little pop out window for time code monitoring. I should probably add that for OSC too. Next question. Hershey Trevetti from Daytona Beach, Florida. What types of accessibility features have you incorporated in your project? And I think in this case, Hashid is um, talking about, uh, ac you know, ac accessibility from site and that type of thing. Is that right, Hashid? That is. And uh, just to kind of give you a little bit more reference, uh, you mentioned it's uh, both on Mac and P uh, Windows PC. So um, we typically for vision impairment side might use a screen reader. So is it right. on a Windows side, you might have an Electron app, which sometimes they're great, or you might have a web app. So I'm just trying to understand, it looks really powerful and useful, but if I run my screen reader through it, can I at least navigate to a certain degree? Because if I'm in a company that might utilize software like this, you know, if they need it, I could be the one that be specialized yep. in this application versus, you know, uh, somebody else that's better at video, so. Absolutely. I mean, um, it is a priority of ours to integrate a lot of those accessibility features into the product. Um, again, we're still in beta, so we're trying to add that as we go. Um, I've had a lot of requests for font size, so you can actually come in here and change font sizes, although that seemed to have not gone as well as I wanted it to. Um, things like that, uh, that you can integrate into Canvas, but uh, there's a lot more to be done, obviously, and a lot more I would like to to do myself. Um, but uh, yeah, at this moment, it, it's not it's not a thing that um, I am not consider. That's a double negative. It's something that's really hot, weighs highly on my mind, and it's just about time and energy to do it. So, yeah. next question. And from Douglas Carmichael, can your product host VST two or three or audio unit instruments or effects? What sort of MIDI functions are available? So we do uh, host uh, AU and VST plugins. I clearly don't have any on this computer. I thought I did. And are these mostly ones that are that are built for real time? As far as the VST, how, how do you see? How do you find the performance? Um, they that is your discretion. There's not really a um, performance meter for them at the moment. Um, if you decide to use a, a plug plugin into the live side of things, that's right. You know, you, it's at your own risk and not <laughs> something yeah, we can do. How much we, audio processing do you put in? So you know, equalization, compression, expansion, those types of things uh, are those are some of those built into the system? At the moment, they're um, they're they're coming. They're uh, on the short list. Um, at the moment, it's mostly delay and then VSTs. So if you wanted to take care of EQ and compression, you can use your external stuff, but um, EQ and compression are on my short list, actually. So, yeah, it's one of those things when I when I watch pretty much anything that deals with audio, I look at it going, I think that the mixing world needs to be um, uh, disrupted. <laughs> and when I yeah, look I at agree. these, uh, I just want a nodal compositor for audio. And then I want to be able to have, you know, just add controllers, add outputs and have all the processing in between and have a a control surface, just do whatever I want it to do, you know, inside of that, inside of that mix rather than having buses. 
It, that's exactly what we're trying to do. And in terms of having this like nonlinear system, we can, we do have a mixer element that enables you to sort of plug in as many elements as you want into it and then affect it here. So this is routing to the output system and coming from that element. And so then all of that can easily be affected via uh, OSC or mix however you want. At some point there will be scenes and DCAs and things in here too that would help um, some of those uh, Absolutely. things you're requesting. Yeah, <laughs> next question. Chad Lafarge from Columbia, Missouri. Do you have an external element that can download data or assets from the LAN WAN via HTTP? Um, we did in V1. I built a, I did a installation where we needed um, weather data and uh, time of day to do a bunch of triggers in this room. Um, and so we did have some of that in V1, but V1 doesn't exist anymore. So it will be on the list and it's a great idea. And uh, next question. And it's from me. Uh, couldn't Isadora control Canvas to get office hours an automated 5.1 mix? Yes. <laughs> Very good. Uh, uh, next, next question. Douglas Carmichael, how useful could Canvas be for electronic musicians? I like the node-based design, and it would be very useful to build MIDI processing pipelines, for example, using Canvas. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, I talk about my short list, but there's a lot of um, small details, one of them being MIDI tracks and uh, samplers built into the software as well. Um, one of the things that, about Canvas that I, I made sure we integrated into V2 was the ability to have tempo and meter um, with the ability to change that over time so things aren't necessarily locked into seconds. So when you're able to do tempo sculpting and things like that, um, it's coming. Let me put it that way. Next question. Javier Alfaro from Mexico City, Mexico. When adding audio files to Canvas, does it get copied to a central library or is there a way to do this manually? Yeah, so uh, when you create a project, it goes ahead and creates a folder uh, wherever you've decided to save it. Um, and that folder goes ahead and creates these files for you. It creates a folder for your, all your audio files, um, your backup files, so we automatically save uh, every 15 minutes, I think, and you can disable that or change that time uh, period. Uh, any images you drop into like the pan or element uh, will get saved, uh, logs are saved, and then this is your actual workspace file. So what happens is, is that there's actually three different programs running on your computer at the same time. One is uh, uh, your view, one is your engine, your audio engine, and one is your server. And so the view knows nothing about those other two parts. And so we actually upload it to the server. The server then passes it on to the engine. The engine holds it. And so every computer that is an engine will have these audio files located on it. So what you can do is if you have a DAW um, and you're working on your DAW and you just want things to show up in Canvas, you could render directly to this audio files folder and it will show up down here in your palette. So then you could just come in here and drag these into your project. That's great. Next question. Josh Kaufman, Pittsburgh, PA. Could the OSC integration with Canvas enable a custom interface that uses this transport? This transport. Yeah. So, so basically, I think that what Josh is kicking at is we could have it. We could build our own interface as long as it's sending out OSC commands, and then yeah. then we could control. So you could this could go back to again. We're building our interface for this show in Universe, so we could theoretically tie Universe to this, so we could build a front end for it and then have it just in universe and then have it send commands directly to this to control that. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. This is how we're, how we're using it with Isadora right now. Yeah. Um, next question. Douglas Carmichael, can Canvas send and receive MIDI clock song position pointer data? MIDI clock song position pointer data. Um, I want to say no, but we do support uh, MIDI time code at the moment. So mm -hmm. I don't know if those two are quite the same. I don't think that they are. Next I'd have question. to go look at the MIDI spec. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Next question. Juan C. Robles in Mexico City, Mexico. Do you have on your development list an SDK to design custom nodes? Yes, we do. Um, and, and not only that, but in the short term, we do have on our list um, integrating with uh, scripting languages. So actually Python, um, so that you could write your own Python script to be able to integrate with the software or have that script be an element that you can use to, to handle the control system. 
And if someone builds that node, those nodes, those are just, uh, they're self-contained uh, encrypted nodes. They're not, they're not some kind of, because one of the things that we saw a lot in nodal compositors um, that I've worked in is the ability to concatenate or, or to group a bunch of nodes into a new node where you just have the, out, the inputs and outputs. So you have all of them together, you build what you want it to do, and then you have an input and an output and you give the user what, you know, what attributes they can control and what you're going to put out. But so you might build a very complex node structure and then combine it into just one new node. And we do that's, this in a lot of different things. Go ahead. That's totally uh, available. You can hit command G and that will group everything into a node. And and the next step of that is uh, being able to encrypt that. <laughs> so, so for oh, us to be I able see. to close to it. The big problem was is no one would share the nodes because they didn't want to share the secret sauce. They just wanted to give you the ability to do the thing. Um, mm. And we don't see a lot of other people do this, but we wanted to be able to, we've always wanted to be able to close it off or potentially sell it. So I figure out a way to do something that might be hundreds of nodes. Um, I don't necessarily want to show you how I did all those things, but I would like to sell that for $5 on a marketplace that sits inside the app. <laughs> so yeah, anyway, I, just, that's a, I that's think it would be thing. the kind of thing that it would be very similar to a VSD structure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it would export a binary kind of yeah. deal and absolutely. you just run it as a... Yeah, absolutely. Next question. Data or dynamic Douglas Carmichael, can Canvas process MIDI data? For example, note on-off messages on channel X from device Y, go to channel Z on device B. Yeah, so we have a MIDI element here and this enables you to be able to set uh, it either sends or receives, um, or both. Um, and you can set whatever node on node off thing you want it to respond to, and it'll send it out its port. Next question. So, Josh Kaufman, Pittsburgh, PA. Josh asked, does Canvas plan on a subscription model or a one-time purchase payment model? Are there any planned plugins or enhancements from first or third parties? Yeah, I, I, that's a really good question. Uh, the idea right now is hopefully um, we integrate with. If if you know if, if you know Sketch, the software for Mac that's built for drawing things, it's one of my softwares I use a lot when doing UX design. Um, it has a model where you're it's subscription, but you if your subscription dies, your software doesn't die. You just don't get any future updates. And so that's sort of the plan moving forward that it's a, you buy it, you own it, but you don't get new ones until you, you know, that makes sense. continue the subscription. Absolutely. Uh, next question. And Josh is back with another. Uh, does Canvas support API interface currently or have plans to add this in the future? And what it's would be the ideal API add-on need that you can see currently? Uh, it's a future plan. Um, for me, it's actually the 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 thing that I see the most needed is if you want to build something custom like the weather element, you know, you want to be able to detect the weather from the National Weather Service. Like that would be cool to be able to build your own and be able to distribute it to people. Do you have more you want to show us? I got through the first pass of questions. Oh, sure. Um, let's see. What would be cool to look at next? Um, we can talk about a lot of the different elements that we have in Canvas. Um, we've talked about the multi-track a little bit. We've talked about the markers. Um, we've talked a little bit about the panner. One of the things that I didn't mention about the panner that I would like to mention is that um, when it comes to shows, sometimes you're not actually in a in this sort of sense of you, you have multiple rooms and you want multiple things to happen. So what we have is in here is the ability to invert the objects. So now your inputs become your outputs and your outputs become your inputs. So I can add, let's say three inputs and each one of those is a different audio source. So let's say input one is a forest sound and input two is a wood or a sea sound and input three is a city sound. I can then take that output and move it around into those three inputs based on where I want to go, very similar to how video games work or how any of that kind of stuff works. And so that's really powerful to me if you're tracking a user or an audience member through multiple rooms, or if you're trying to, um, you sort of have a non-linear show to be able to choose which, uh, you know, scenario you're in at the moment, you can choose uh, based off of this. And of course, you can continue to draw paths for it as well. So it can be automated. Well, um, you can draw paths, but you can also um, have another variable. So a position data coming in from an external device 
yes. you know, that, that's giving you data. So that could be responding to something in the natural world, could be pushing this uh, this audio object into in the in your system. Is that correct? Exactly, exactly. I have a thing about most spatial audio is built to very specific systems, but with Canvas, we've tried to make it as generic as possible to allow users to really um, work with what they have because things might not always be as cut and dry as a 5.1 system in live production audio. You might have a random speaker hidden behind a column and how does that fit into spatial audio? Most spatial mm -hmm. audio things, it gets weird. And so... Um, the panner element allows you to sort of get weird with it, um, which I like. Um, one of the other things about it is that it's channel based. So you don't have to think about this in terms of like, this is something in space. You can think of it as like, these are two different channels that I'm mixing between. So if I don't have it inverted, for example, and I wanted to mix between a wet and dry signal and have a reverb unit reverb tail out on a cue, um, I can have that do those kinds of things, if that makes right. any sense. So it's, yeah. it really opens up the world to being able to do a lot of things that we can't do in a lot of software. It's more of a generalized solution as opposed to a specific one. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Right, absolutely. Um, uh, let's go to a couple more questions. Uh, go ahead, next question. I have a question. Uh, could you build simultaneous multiple surround mixes with Canvas? simultaneous multiple surround mixes. I yeah, I mean, have multiple panners, right? Yeah, you can have as many of these as you want and set them up however you would like. I have a um, one of the uses use cases recently was a theater out of Utah that had uh, like a 32 channel surround system. And so they had a panner that would do those 32. And then they had a couple down mixes for that. So they would have one that would have all 32 channels and one that would have four channels so that you could get quadrant based. Um, and then another one that would have, you know, maybe their whole system in place, including like, cause it was in the round theater. So um, they would have their mains and things like that in it. So they could pan between all of the different sources and send whichever audio file to that panner wherever they needed it right sorry i'm just thinking about the possibilities there that's pretty yeah there's a well, ton of possibilities and it's you could really have multiple, open yeah you could have effects or if we were able to do it virtually over let's say over the internet we're able to send the let's just say we can send the commands over the internet um to each other uh, over a vpn or, or something like that you could theoretically know each room could be three different rooms with the same show they all have different speaker configurations and you could customize it customize the the process for each room yeah, so exactly. Exactly. Like, you have got, a, a, IP, like an IP based speaker system in all over the building, you could just send all kinds of mixes all over the place for different uses. Exactly. Exactly. I think one of the things, uh, you know, one of the simplest use cases is the idea of like a lobby and a stage. Yeah. Um, if I wanted to have, you know, pre-show music playing in both, I could easily just drop in a, a single track element here, have a playlist and then, uh, send it to both of those machines and edit it in one place instead of two places, you know, as well as because it is actually a PTP clock between the different sources, they're relatively in sync. Um, they're off by a few milliseconds. So, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm still, my brain is still going to like what I could do with what we could do with that. That's, that's really a, really a fascinating source. So on, on the single track while I'm sitting here, uh, you can drop in, uh, this is exactly what it's it sounds like. So instead of a multi-track where it's like a DAW, uh, this right. is a single track where you can have one track playing at a time. And this gives you the ability to build a playlist or like a random fire. So if you wanted to do like footsteps and have it random fire, you know, as someone's yeah. walking on stage, you can do that here. Yeah. Um, so we give this sort of ability. We, we try to make things as generic as possible mm -hmm. that you can do so much more with. Yeah. That's <laughs> um, great. So that's uh, just wanted to mention that while we're here. Fantastic. Next question. And it's from Josh Kaufman from Pittsburgh, PA. Can you give us an example of a past successful workflow using Canvas or perhaps a hypothetical execution the Canvas is uniquely suited for? Well, uh, it depends on the type of show. Are we talking like a theater show? Are we talking about an installation? Yeah, um, I've got, you know, if it's a straight play theater show, um, you basically can build out all of your elements here in your canvases. Um, and people will mostly build each of their like chunks of cues in multiple canvases. So we can add new ones and fill each one of these up with different cues. Um, and then, uh, 
only in each one of the canvases. So like this canvas has, let's say like, uh, well, let's just do a couple cues uh, here. And, you know, this is Q, A, B, and C. Or and these canvases nobody... talk to, can talk to each other so they can send those commands between them? Uh, the canvases? Yeah. Yeah, so I can actually trigger a different canvas if I wanted to by right clicking right. on the uh, output port. So I can right. say which element I want to send it to, or I can add a new element to connect to. Right. Um, each of those, each of these is a different queue. And then when your operator is watching the show, they can just sit here like this and tap through each one of those. Right. <clears throat> Excuse Great. me. Uh, Mitchell, you want to add, add something? Yeah, I just wanted, I just another thought occurred, like it, I see Alex uh, gears turning. Um, if I was doing a live show and I was the announcer, Instead of just fading the uh, opening music down, wouldn't it be cool to change the mix to allow the announcer to speak over and then go back to the original mix when the, when the announcer part is over? Now, that's something that would be really cool. It'd be a completely different way to do it. So I haven't talked about fades in, in Canvas yet, but in each audio type of element, to answer your question and to like go, uh, you just got me really excited about something. Um, <laughs> uh, the fades, you can, fades are built into each one. So currently we give you a fade in, a fade out and a restore. And so if you wanted to add a fade and we'll just call this the ducker, duck fade, we can just come in here and say, I want you to go down 6 dB. I can run this thing, fire the duck, and then come back and say, fire the restore, and it'll restore back to wherever your initial state is, right? So you can then affect your initial state, and then the duck will always be 6 dB down. Well, we can come in here and, and would say- it, Would it be starting well, to play the duck, or would it always be playing it and just jumping to it when you queued it? When you queued it. So we could come in here into our actions and say, I want this to be fade, duck fire and then i want this to be fade fade in fire. so it would keep those it would keep those audios oh. in sync those two yeah in. yes in yeah. terms of like synchronized between the sound it just sort yeah. of affects the level right 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 and no, the announcer thinking... could key a microphone and that would uh, fire a trigger off that uh, would initiate the fade yeah, exactly. So well, we could do, let me just add it. in one more fade here for the fade out. So we can say, I want three different triggers, four different triggers. This one starts the queue. This one ducks the queue. This one restores the queue back to its normal level. And then this one is a fade out. Yeah. Let's make this one fade out. Yeah. You could, you could also, you could also have it so that it, it takes the vocal track. I mean, depending on what you had control over, it takes take the vocal track out and drop everything 6 dB so I can talk over it and then I hit it. And then then you hear the voice come back in and it go back up to where it was. It'd be kind of kind of fun. Exactly. A little, a little extra processing there. Exactly. And each one of these can be tied to OSC so you could have it out of your touch inter interface as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael asked, uh, do you have plans to distribute releases directly from the website? Yes. Once it's public, we will. Um, I mentioned the Discord, and uh, part of the reason we did the Discord is because we actually do like to talk to people. Um, and if you have ideas or feedback, you can reach me most of the time and others most of the time during the day. Um, in fact, this morning, someone was texting me or messaging me on Discord about a, an issue that they had found uh, that we are I'm going to solve as soon as I'm off with you guys. So yeah, that's great. You know. Um, yeah, and I, I can't, it's, it's a, it's a, I jumped in pretty early. A couple of us jumped all, all jumped in on one day, I think <laughs> that, that we were like suddenly interested in, in, uh, in what you're doing there. So it's, it, it is a very responsive discord. So yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we try to be at least, you know, within the same day of responding to things, depending on what's going on, but usually it's within, you know, 10 minutes. Yeah. Next question. Juan C. Robles in Mexico City, Mexico. Is there a way of creating a path on the fly for the panner or control through OSC, the audio position? Yeah, uh, the path, you don't need to create a path. A path is a, a, is a static thing. So a path is going to be, it's always going to do the same thing. But if you wanted to come into here and say, I want my objects, I want to change the X and I want to change the Y, for my input object, I can then come in here with a, um, you know, either an OSC element or a couple sliders. Uh, let me just get this hooked up real quick to affect the X. And this one will do the Y and we'll move these out of the way. Ah, uh, dadgummit, we'll move those out of the way. <laughs> um, and so if we're sitting here in the panner, this should affect the X and the Y of that, whoops, go back, sorry. 
Uh, this should affect the Y of that input source. And then if you wanted that to be a different range, so we go ahead and set a range for that parameter. Right now it's negative five to plus five. If I wanted to be negative five to plus 10, um, I could then see that that's gonna go to plus 10 and negative five. So you can set your range for this slider as well. Next question. Next question coming in from Josh Kaufman again from Pittsburgh, PA. Hey, Chris, you can mention the, uh, you mentioned that you have a theater background in audio engineering. Is this the target market that you see, or do you have a broader adoption in mind? It's a very good question. Um, I would love a broader market, but I think because of my background, I've started in this market um, because I know it the best. Um, we would love to see it be more integrated into sort of multimedia experiences. Like I think that's where it really shines. So, you know, all these experience things going around the country would be great for, you know, um, I don't see it necessarily as like going to control a rock and roll show anytime soon. But if you do need playback for a rock and roll show, you know, there's no reason why it wouldn't. Um, but if, if, if there are things missing that would then enable it to work for a different broader different market i'm happy to entertain those ideas i'm not and stuck into one idea and a lot of those things i mean like a, a good example is isadora is is a um typically a theater you know if, um program and we figured out how to run a whole show on it <laughs> so, yeah so so it's you know it's it's uh by uh, tying it in and specifically with uh zoom osc i don't know if you're familiar with zoom osc but it yeah yeah you know, lets us um do a lot it's uh, it's one of those things that actually I got the reason I got into Canvas building Canvas. One of the reasons was I have a good friend. His name's Jared Mazachi, who does who's a projections multimedia designer, and he did everything in Isadora. And I would watch him build shows that were so complex and so integrated with what was happening. And I was like, damn, I wish we could do that for Cam, uh, you know, in audio. And so right. that's it's part of the reason we got into doing this. So. That's great. That's great. Next question. Douglas Carmichael is back. Could you see Canvas becoming a full show control environment beyond just audio? Absolutely. Yeah. Does it now? It looks like it just because it, it can send out all those all the commands that's necessary to make it work. Yeah, it, at this point, you know, we want to we want to integrate as many of the control systems as possible. PSN, uh, Artnet, SA, ACN, that kind of stuff would be really nice. Um, we're trying not to get into like the projections and, and lighting market because I feel like those are really swamped in general and audio is not as served in this area. Um, but I could see this as a, a control center for all of those things. Right. Um, next question. Josh Kaufman from Pittsburgh. He wants to know how does Canvas accommodate binaural audio processing for a stereo only output? Uh, there's no binaural processing in Canvas. If you wanted a binaural processor, you could run it through, um, a VST, or you can have an external. Yep. Uh, next system. question. Arshi Trivedi from Daytona Beach, Florida asked, I've heard of recent conventions around in the States. Have you been a part of any of late? And what was the feedback if you did? Have you been going to any of the, uh, you know, NABs, IBCs, uh, theater conventions? Have you done any of those? We did USITT this year, which was in Baltimore. So I, I'm in DC, so it's not too far away from me. So we went and visited there. I have a lot of friends, obviously. Um, but no, since we're still in early phases, I haven't gone and visited all the the market or the, the conferences yet. Yeah. Next question. Josh Kaufman wants to know, is it possible to attach geolocation devices, telemetry to move audio sources in Canvas spatial audio space? For example, sounds to track the movement of an object or actor on a stage. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you have anything like black tracks or something like that, that corresponds, that sends out um, OSC data, you can use that. Um, like I said, uh, one of our future goals is to integrate something like PSN, which is a three-dimensional positioning uh, protocol that enables for that kind of stuff. So it, if you can do OSC or MIDI at this point, um, Otherwise, other stuff is coming. That's great. Next question. Uh, from Douglas Carmichael. On your website, it mentions you can join the Discord to download Canvas. I don't see where to download it for Mac OS. How do I download your product? Oh, yeah. It's just the welcome channel. So hopefully the Discord opens up the welcome channel when you show up and the links are right in there. Um, if that is not the case, let us know. We'll fix it today. Um, I think that the... Uh, 
the links themselves are, I don't have Discord open. Um, I can post uh, the actual links if someone needs them uh and can't find the welcome channel we'll, we'll find our way we'll find our way to yeah. discord yeah. you probably have a couple people from here it, uh, jumping. it's jumping working in. already I already downloaded i got it running on my machine that's great great yeah. absolutely uh any last words chris uh nothing for me i'm really excited to have come and thank you for having me um i hope this was enlightening and there's a yeah. lot more to canvas that uh we're gonna add and we're gonna see in the future so hopefully we get to share well, with you guys some more as you may have guessed, we're a geeky bunch. <laughs> so oh, yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. So we really like to dig in. It looks really great. It's a great interface. Uh, it's a really, really great um, uh, process. So we got one more question coming in from um, uh, Mickey Makator. And, and go ahead next. And Mickey asks, any thoughts on working on an AAX plugin that would allow one to use your neat panning tools to pan within PT, Pro Tools? Um, like exporting a plugin that's the, the panner element? I guess. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, the, the 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 panning tools look really great, and I think that the you know better than what's funny is is that the surround panning tools uh, are limited. Yeah. You know, they, they you know I think a lot of times what happens is is that they they built them, and the people who did it are audio specialists, not visual specialists, and so right. a lot of the panning tools aren't as uh, intuitive as they could be. If people want that, I'm happy to move it over to being a, a VST plugin. Um, yeah. It's Accessible. relatively simple to do, so I'm not. But I just need people to ask for it, I guess. Okay. The, 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 so the the answer to everybody is join the Discord channel. Like, yeah, get, tell know, me what you want, and uh, we'll tend to do it. <laughs> you know? tend to, yeah. So so all of us will will start jumping in there and, and making requests. So it's, it's great. <laughs> really, really impressive piece of software. Um, Thank you. Really excited to see it. And uh, as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh, I gotta have. I got to have these guys on, <laughs> you know, like, like, let's, let's, let's take a look at this. So, um, so thank you so much. We may drag you on every once in a while, see if we can't even set up a couple labs here and there. We do labs and during the day, um, and, uh, see if we can't all play on it, play with it together. So it yeah, be, great. Uh, Anytime you want me, I'm happy to show up. So outstanding. Yeah. Well, thank Thanks you again. Thank you so much for your time. Really, really impressive piece of software. Thanks. Thanks, Christopher. Yeah, thank absolutely. you. Um, thanks to our producers for all the great questions uh, from all over the world. Um, so, uh, so thanks to, to listening at whatever hour you're listening to it right now and asking those great live questions. Um, thanks to the panelists. Of course, we can't do this without you. And thanks to the the team on the back end that makes this show go every single day, seven days a week. Um, really, really, really great work. And now we're going to keep the conversation going in after hours. Chris, you'll have to join us in after hours sometime. We just keep doing this all day, 21 hours a day. It's just a little more free form. I need more time to play with all this software. No kidding. Just, I'm going to get a job where I just get to play with something all day. Isn't that what we do? Whisper. Stupid deadlines.